Hey, Kansas City. Welcome to episode 22 of the Made in Casey podcast. We are now in day 22 of the 30-day stay-at-home order. I'm Tyler Enders. I'm Keith Bradley. And I'm Thomas McIntyre. Today, we'll be talking about how America's modern-day equivalent to the manufacturing industry might just be down the street. All right, before we get started, I have a very special announcement. I will not be getting into why it took this long because that would end up being a long, ranty therapy session about my relationship with technology. But we are now on Apple Podcasts. We've made it. We haven't been this whole time. You guys are supposed to be way more excited. So, yeah, I again, I'm not, I'm not going to get into it, but it's really good news. So if everyone at home could go subscribe, but even more importantly, go give us a review You can simply rate us. You just have to like click the number of stars you want. You don't even have to write something like you do with Yelp, you know, where your review has to be so long for it to be counted. We would love for you to leave a review with more information, but please do go rate us. That's the best thing you could do for us with this podcast right now. So now that that's out of the way, Keith, Thomas, how are you guys? Well, one quick note on that. I am very excited, actually. I was just joking about thinking we already were on it. It is uh, a huge step because... I went to the office for a few moments today uh, to do things with a check printer that I can't do otherwise and came home and heard our podcast playing in our home. And Jess had listened for the very first time today because it was on the Apple Whoa. podcast app. So, yeah, that it, is uh, awesome. she now knows why I've been hiding in a closet for one to one and a half hours a day during this pandemic. And it's because of the podcast. It's also remarkable that your guys' relationship is such that you're okay with her not having listened to 22 episodes that you've recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she's, she's got much better things to do, but she, uh, also our conversations afterwards typically are, are because of the conversations the three of us have during the podcast. So gotcha. none of it's new information to her. She feels like she gets the live version, but yeah, she liked it a lot. She thinks I sound funny, which I do too, but, uh, that's okay. <laughs> Don't we all? That's so funny. You mentioned that Thomas, because my wife, who you know, well, also just started listening to the podcast today. What the heck, man. And, and get this. She was, I caught her on the phone telling her sister who you also know well thomas <laughs> to start listening to the podcast today as well and, t- and told her specifically start with the episode with the mayor it's the good one <laughs> amazing yeah my my dad's gonna start listening too so i think we just got a whole new wave of uh, of listeners because of this <laughs> it is interesting though but we should move on because we got a lot to cover today but i was listening to the one that she was listening which i think was day three or four And hearing some of the thoughts that we had, and we did do one episode recently that readdressed some of the things, but us talking about what we think it's going to look like afterwards, I feel like we might have some different thoughts on those things now. It was interesting to hear our our day two, day three, day four thought processes uh, now that we've been in this for so long. But yeah, no, exciting big step. Uh, Please give us reviews with the stars. It is amazing just how quickly everything's changing and how much I'm sure our opinions and thoughts have changed and how much clarity we've gotten. But okay. Let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be talking about manufacturing and the seemingly unrelated restaurant industry. And to kick it off, we're going to start with an email that we received from a listener. It was really well thought out. Keith, do you want to go ahead and read that for us? Yeah, here's the email from uh, one of our listeners. In episode 18 or 19, you had a discussion about supply chains. There was some discussion about local versus international supply chains. But I think the biggest issue is the fact that almost all businesses have gone to just-in-time delivery and inventory control. So companies don't have inventory on site, sitting in a warehouse. The listener goes on to quote Ellen Chang, a financial writer for U.S. News and World Report, by explaining the thought process that decreasing the amount of unnecessary inventory can save valuable time and money. The listener then quotes the CEO of a Minnesota-based software company that was interviewed in Chang's article. His company offers solutions to streamline hospital supply management. He says, when you overstock inventory everywhere, it ties up cash. Having 5 million in excess inventory is equal to 5 million cash that could be used to improve patient care and generate revenue for the hospital. So why don't we have enough PPP on hand for the pandemic? Because administrators are maximizing the revenue for a quarter so they can get a bonus. The incentives work against preparedness. And if the state or federal government doesn't back up the process, then folks like me are reusing masks and wearing less than adequate PPP. We've seen car assembly grind to a halt because of a specific supplier was offline. 
companies need to have more of a cushion of materials and other inventory to smooth out the bumps. We talk about cash on hand in terms of days of operation, but auditors should also look at supplies on hand for continued operations. Thanks, Keith. And thanks so much for the listener that sent that in. He is a doctor at an area hospital. And we touched on this in a couple of our episodes, and I absolutely love this listener's really poignant example. In episode 12, The Rise of Local, we talked about how our supply chains need to be resilient. We need multiple suppliers who can ramp up if and when needed. And if you have all of your operations, all of your factories running at peak efficiency and running at peak capacity, then by definition, you cannot ramp up. However, this is kind of what capitalism requires. Capitalism requires us to operate as efficiently as possible and at as much capacity as possible. So we therefore don't have any room for redundancies and resiliency in our backup plans. So as we discussed in episode 13, um, which was titled Dreaming of a Medical Revolution, we talked about how maybe capitalism isn't the best option for medical innovation. And as this listener has pointed out, maybe capitalism isn't the best for healthcare in general. So a couple additional thoughts on this, and I do love the example that they, that they gave us, is that the, uh, the opportunity cost is the real problem here. And so we have this $5 million of cash, for example, sake, available to do something with. That cash could be going to excess face masks to have on hand for this given problem of running out or in a time of a pandemic where supply chains are affected. We have a cushion of supplies. We're able to get through a time like this in a much better manner. Uh, but the other thought is it's not completely unreasonable for CEOs and managers to think that that amount of money invested in backup isn't the most efficient use of money for the hospital to operate in a good climate, which is when hospital operates most of the time. And so I agree. I, I, I think there needs to be a cushion. I think there should have been uh, less of a lean system in place for hospitals and for places that are going to be the most needed in a time like this where supply chains are affected. But I'm with everything, there's a balance. And so I, I don't think it's upsetting to think that they use that cash to potentially better the operations of the hospital, hire more staff, do things like that, that on most given days are beneficial for the hospital. It's just that when we go into a time like this, it's really highlighted how important it is to have backup supplies. Yeah, this is really simplifying it. But I just think of a growth chart over time of GDP or output for whether it's our economy or the global economy. And I think about how it stair steps up pretty nicely, and we're always trying to see how fast we can increase it. That GDP tracks with a lot of things, quality of life, life expectancy, not perfectly. There are totally times where it doesn't match up. But for the most part, we as a society have decided that if we are increasing our economic activity, we're probably improving life across the globe. And I think that with our idea of efficiency at all costs, we've tried to push that growth as high as possible. And what happens is we have these market corrections, and you see it in the stock market all the time when the stock market recorrects and all of a sudden everything's devalued and then it hits you know the, the new true value. And so with GDP, with economic output for manufacturing and other things, I think that maybe if we pursue a slightly less steep curve that allows for more redundancies, then we'll actually get to our end destination faster because we won't have these massive steps backwards in a time like this. I agree with that. And it is oversimplifying it. But generally speaking, it's the idea of, of baby steps consistently being taken versus massive leaps forward and massive leaps backwards uh, being less productive over time. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into manufacturing. I want to start with PPE. So most PPE isn't manufactured in the United States. China actually supplies half of the world's medical equipment. And for fear of anyone thinking that we are isolationists with all of our talk about local and keeping things uh, manufactured in America, I want to make it super clear that the world has absolutely benefited in many, many ways from globalization, but it needs refinement. And that's from you know the, the value of human labor to more resilient supply chains. But when you look at PPE and you think about the trade war that happened with China months before coronavirus came about, that actually had a really material effect. And so the tariffs that were imposed by Trump included tariffs on medical equipment. And that actually directly contributed in a very material way to our reduced stockpiles of equipment. Coincidentally enough, not many news outlets covered it, but the U.S. quietly lifted these tariffs last week to allow us to get more ventilators in and more PPP in. 
So we know that manufacturing as a whole is incredibly important, and it's been incredibly important to the United States. We can think back to the glory days of U.S. manufacturing jobs. Good jobs, people making things, benefits, the company man. That was kind of the glory day in America. And so let's take a look at that first, look at the numbers to compare them to today. Yeah, so if we look at a bit of a timeline and the numbers during that timeline, if you look back to the peak in the 1950s of manufacturing, so not manufacturing due to World War II, but the peak manufacturing in the 1950s, during that time, three out of every 10 Americans were in the manufacturing industry. Uh, in 1960, foreign goods made up just 8% of Americans' purchases. Uh, today, nearly 60% of everything we buy is made overseas. So if you're looking at this graph I'm looking at in front of me, you can see there's a decline in American-made purchases in manufacturing jobs. It's because of forces like cheaper labor, manufacturing efficiencies, trade policies, monetary policies, etc. So then you get to this point on the graph where only about 8% of our workforce is in manufacturing today. Now, with all that being said, it's important to note uh, that U.S. manufacturing is the second largest in the world, and we're producing around 18% of the world's goods for example's sake, that's more than the entire economic output of Canada, Korea, or Mexico. Uh, first, of course, is China. Okay. Here are a few more stats to provide some perspective on how big U.S. manufacturing is today. Are you guys ready? Yep. In 2018, manufacturing made up $2.33 trillion, according to the Bureau of Economics. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported 12.85 million manufacturing jobs with an estimated 15 to 17 million jobs that are indirectly supported by the manufacturing industry. So manufacturing is still our biggest industry in our country by far, even though in 1970 manufacturing was roughly 24.3% of our GDP, double what it was in 2018. Yeah. So as I said in the intro, today we're going to talk about how America's modern day equivalent to the manufacturing industry might just be down the street. Again, as Thomas said in the 50s, one out of every three working Americans was in manufacturing. Now it's less than one in 10. But people are still working. America has just shifted to a service-based economy. And so it's been services, it's been healthcare, where people are now working instead. So I had you guys read an article published in Food & Wine last week by a restaurateur named Bobby Stuckey. And his kind of thesis was that independent restaurants are the manufacturing industry of the 1950s. He outlines that independent restaurants contribute up to 4% of GDP and are part of a $1 trillion sector in the economy. When I like to think about this, I love that he is bringing a voice to independent restaurants. But if you take it to the restaurant industry as a whole, as we've outlined in other podcasts, the restaurant industry as a whole is about as big as the manufacturing industry. It's actually, it's actually larger. And then when you look at the jobs that the restaurant industry supports, it's about equivalent to the jobs that the manufacturing industry supports. And so the shift that the author of this article highlights that I really like is that there is a restaurant in every town in America. And there's an independent restaurant in almost every town in America as well. And this might be the new factory type job. He talks about how they take people of all color, all stripes, all backgrounds, how people who were on tough times in 2008 when they couldn't find a job, they found a job in the restaurant industry. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what your guys' thoughts were on whether restaurants could be the manufacturing industry of yesteryear. So a couple thoughts. Uh, the comparison I like a lot. I think it's very interesting. I think there's a lot of major differences, and I haven't fully thought about how they play into this, but the idea of the manufacturing jobs typically were a single employer had a much larger employee base where the restaurant industry is way more granular and likely a good reason why there hasn't been as much government stimulus directed towards it because it's less likely, you know, if three manufacturing plants closed, the job impact is massive compared to where if three restaurants were to close. And then the other thought being that restaurants are very localized in terms of their economies and how they stimulate the economy, where manufacturing potentially is being distributed throughout the U.S. or out of the U.S. And the impacts of that versus serving the small community around the restaurant. Again, just just comparison and contrast between the two. Not sure what those mean or how they how they impact the story that we're trying to tell right here. But there there's some major differences that I think are important to totally address. Are. Yeah, and I 
what works really nicely for this comparison is just the scope of both of the industries. And in 2008, he notes, restaurants didn't get any sort of bailout. And it's because they're so decentralized and they're so disparate, there is no lobbying force. So there's actually now an independent restaurant coalition that has tens of thousands of individuals. I'm sure it's growing like crazy. And they're now trying to lobby Congress for the first time to say, hey, you need to pay attention to us too. Um, I think you're totally right and that there are tons of massive differences. And so the first one that comes to mind for me is the wages and then also the benefits. But the reason I like this comparison is because maybe it makes us reframe and we think, okay, well, if we lost, you know, however many tens of millions of manufacturing jobs over the past however many decades, but we grew it in the service industry, we need to make sure that we take care of these people just as much as we are taking care of them when they're working in another job. And so maybe that helps us reframe when we think about, well, you don't really have lobbying groups for people in the restaurant industry. You don't really have unions or any other way to organize as a workforce. So I think that these jobs have been forgotten in that when it comes to everyone coming to the table and talking about fair wages, there's a reason why our waiters and waitresses receive $2.50 as a, a base minimum wage and then the rest is left to tips. And so maybe this is the time where we look at the hard facts and confront it and realize, wow, tens of millions of Americans are supported by this industry. It makes up a, a huge part of our GDP. Maybe we need to rethink the restaurant industry and the way that we treat it. I also like the idea that the shift to the restaurant industry from the manufacturing industry potentially is a safer shift in that it's based in a commodity of food consumption um, that, as far as I'm aware of, isn't, isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. Obviously, there's lots of different ways to intake food and consume, but as, as humans, we're going to need that. I think the manufacturing industry was heavily dependent on technology and other factors that changed often, sometimes making a factory irrelevant and therefore a, a workforce being impacted in a major way. And so there's, I think, less risk in that industry from that standpoint. Obviously, we know as, as small business owners, the statistics about, as Tyler mentioned, starting a restaurant or starting a business. And so there's, there's lots of risks in that sense. But that's where the granular part comes in. Obviously, as a, as a full industry, as a complete sector of our GDP, it's pretty stable, I th believe, and it's not going anywhere. It's the individuals within that sector that are at higher risk. Uh, but across the board, it's it's a safer bet. It's a safer investment. Yeah, it'd be really hard to outsource a restaurant job too. So of course, that when we're hit by automation in the coming years, yes, some restaurants I'm sure will automate employees out of jobs. But the independent restaurants that we're talking about, those are the ones that are all about the people capital, all about having really good customer service, all about having that personal touch. Yes, and those are the those are the type of restaurants that we see people here in Kansas City and across the country rallying around to make sure they don't go out of business because they they do provide a unique flavor, no pun intended, to our communities. And the other part of this, which the article mentions, is just the massive, massive both local and national supply chain, but behind any individual restaurant, um, which has ram ramifications, you know, in your local economy as well as other economies, which I would imagine there's some similar tie-ins to manufacturing about the supply chains getting to and from one particular factory. And Tyler, question for you. The, we're using the phrase independent restaurant in this story and in this conversation. What does that mean exactly? Does that mean the owner locally owned a restaurant or does that, so does that not include like the Paneras or the franchise type things? I don't know how you'd split hairs with franchises, but yes, my understanding of this coalition is it's those that are eligible for the PPP, and so that's groups under 500. Now, there have been some restaurant groups and hospitality groups lobbying Congress to say, hey, even though we have more than 500 because that we're franchised or the way that our corporate structure works, we still need support. But my understanding is that those in the independent restaurant coalition, on average, probably have one restaurant per business. And I'm sure there are some that are, you know, small local chains or maybe even small franchises. But again, I think these are almost all relatively small. What are your all's thoughts on, based on a couple of episodes ago when we talked about essential workers and then also based on our conversation with um, Casey Runs on Hospitality, do you think that this article, this coalition will have a positive impact on the restaurant industry, particularly with regards to wages for employees? And 
and generally the the work culture and work environment in restaurants, which is also a pretty tough work environment to uh, to thrive in sometimes. I think the thing that's exciting for me when we talk about how a crisis can all of a sudden spur action that wouldn't have happened otherwise, the organization that's happening now, all of it's really focused on how the PPP is being rolled out and what type of immediate support there is. But all those bonds that are being created by these tens of thousands of local restaurants, I think that those bonds will prevail and that that might turn into a conversation on wages in the future. It might turn into a conversation on food security or on local sourcing. And so I think that now that these connections have been forged, that might be really, really powerful. So it might not happen immediately, but it could happen in the future. And when I think about as a governing body looks to figure out, okay, what cities, what municipalities are struggling right now? If you're trying to spur economic development, maybe these local restaurants could be part of that. You know, as the article says, there are local restaurants or there are independent restaurants spread throughout the U.S. This could be a really good hub of activity where you know, okay, we can go ahead and inject some capital here, hire a bunch of people. These run super lean and almost all the money that goes into them either gets paid out in wages or it's for food that supports farmers. And then the output is food for people in the community. And so it seems like a really safe investment if you're trying to spur economic impact in a targeted way. Yeah, I agree. Did you say restaurants are a safe investment? <laughs> <laughs> that's a totally fair point. No, but that, that's what I that's what I commented on earlier, though. It is you, you're kind of we've kind of got to separate uh, the the industry from the independent uh, restaurant and, and not to not want to support the independent restaurant. But if the industry as a whole is doing well, uh, I think we have a rising tide uh, situation. So, uh, yeah, I think I think the the industry as a whole is a safe bet. Uh, it's just because it's such a safe bet is it's so highly competitive. And that's where we get the volatility of one off restaurants and independent restaurants having a hard time to survive. Well, I hate to cut this one short, but Keith or Thomas, if you have any other thoughts, jump in. Keith's got a uh, call scheduled for CNBC. So we need to get him rushed off to that. Uh, that's it for me. I think that's great. I, I don't think I cannot think of a better engine in a community to invest in to help spur the economy than the restaurant based on what Tyler just talked about and the different ways it can affect farmers, citizens, employees, et cetera. So I'm going to think on that. And if I have any other thoughts, we'll, we'll talk about it next episode. And now I'm just hungry. So thanks, guys. <laughs> cool. Keith, good luck with the interview. Again, everyone at home, we are now on Apple Podcasts, so please do go ahead and give us a rating on there. And then if you'd like to reach out to us, you can find us on Twitter at MadeInKC underscore, and you can email us your thoughts at hello at MadeInKC.co. Thank you.